All right, welcome back for the third hour. I don't know whether it's the battery uh, in this. I apologize for the distortion for the house system here. For this third hour, let's have some fun with uh, with some of the stuff, and let's uh, let's do a few things. I'll be doing some demos as well as um, some slides here as well. I want to talk about D rats? How many of you have used D rats? As I suspected, not very many. Whether you're in Aries, Races, Emergency Communications or not, DRATS can be a very useful program that uses the 1200 BPS data that goes along uh, with every DSTAR transmission. Um, DRATS is a program that was developed by a gentleman named Dan Smith out in uh, Oregon. Um, he's an IBM programmer by trade, so he uh, did a very good job with this program. And as all hams love, it's free software. Uh, it was originally developed for use with just a D-Star radio, but it has been enhanced uh, that it can work with just an internet connection, and then there's a way to bridge it with RF. Uh, also, there is uh, some limited AX25 um, capabilities in there to interface to a standard TNC. All of that has not been built in yet. Uh, some of us are... Uh, want to understand what those capabilities are and how they might work. I would think that it would be extremely powerful if you could bridge the packet world with the DSTAR data world um, in a way under one common program that would uh, kind of be the Swiss Army knife of doing multiple functions. And this program really has the possibilities of doing that. So if you uh, want to download the program, uh, www.d-rats.com. Does anyone know where the, the term D-rats came from? Star backwards, rats. Don't you love it? D-rats can be used for very simple data communications between one or more stations. Um, our local Aries group in our county uh, uses it as one of our software packages and modes that, uh, that we use. Um, in Georgia, we adopted it as one of three um, data applications that um, we standardized on. Um, I think if you went to any club or ARIES meeting and you said, bring your favorite data communications mode, there wouldn't be more than two people that could probably talk to each other because one would be running uh, FL Digi, one would be running WinLink, one would be running DRATS, one would be running Keyboard Packet, and on and on and on. So. Uh, one of the things we've been doing in Georgia is trying to standardize on a few that we can train on and use as the appropriate mode for a particular situation. You can use DRATS with or without a radio. You can use on the internet, and then there's a way uh, called a RATflector, which is a DRATS reflector that you can bridge a radio and the internet for those users that are RF or not. One of the features I really like for those of you who do emergency communications, you're probably familiar with using tactical call signs. Well, it works especially well on DSTAR because your FCC call sign or Canadian call sign, I understand we have some from Canada here, is transmitted with the radio. But over DRATS, I can put Shelter 1, EOC, whatever I want, and the messages will carry that tactical call sign, but you're still meeting the FCC um, or Industry Canada uh, designation on that. DRATS is multi-platform, like some of the things we've talked about today. It'll run on um, all versions of Windows except Windows 3.1. There's probably a ham in here that's still using that. Mac OS and uh, Linux as well. The multiple interfaces to DRATS, a radio and internet connection, you can use it over a DV dongle uh, or a KISS TNC for some of the limited packet capabilities. Here are the major functions in DRATS. Simple messaging, kind of like an email formatted messaging, and within that you can... Uh, include forms in that messaging. Chat, very straightforward um, chat. Everybody sees it like instant messaging. File transfer, I love this feature. 
if I connect to a station, that station has designated a folder on their computer where they've stored some files. Unattended, I can either download a file from them or upload a file to them. You get a screen I'll show you here in a minute that looks like an FTP screen. Forms capability, there are some predefined forms like an NTS radiogram, uh, an ICS-213 form that's included in it. Um, and when you're doing that, you fill out the form, it transmits just the data, not all the form, and then puts it back into that form on the other end. You can use the, uh, if your radio is GPS equipped, uh, you can use the mapping function for reporting your position. Um, and the maps are downloadable within the program. You don't have to buy them from some other source. Ratflector. DRATS reflector. I can define here where I want all the connections bridged together. You know, it's like the reflector on voice that we've been talking about, but I can bridge, uh, I can bridge to another rat flector to connect them, to join them. I can uh, connect to a radio. At my house, I'm running one of these for our local Aries group, and I bridge to a D-Star radio, which is on a repeater, and also to the Internet. So I can take Internet users and RF users. They all see the same information. I put together a document um, that's in several locations. Um, if you're, it's a getting started document with screenshots and everything that'll help you really get going with, with DRATS. Um, our local ARIES website is www.gwinnettaries.org. But if you want to join the DRATS group, Yahoo group, in the file section, uh, it's out there as well. Um, uh, the getting started document will guide you through with screenshots and setting up DRATS. I tried to put that together where someone who is starting from ground zero uh, can go. The DRATS program itself is out on the DRATS website. Current version is 3.3. Uh, um, there are just a couple of things that you'll need to set up to get going. One is in the file preferences, and that'll be your general station information, your name, call sign, or tactical call sign. Uh, and then when I say file preferences radio, that's either the, the COM port that connects to a radio or the location of the internet rat flector. Here's that startup screen. Um, just so I, I designated my call sign there, you'll see I put like an SSID on the end of it, like on APRS. And the only reason I did that, if I'm running multiple on multiple computers, um, it can designate. I could easily put in there Shelter 1, Fire Station 1. Uh, it can be anything you want there. There's not much else to, to set up on that screen. You really only need to configure... The, the top line here, file transfer path, it's where you're defining a folder on your PC that if a station wants to go download or upload a file to or from you, that folder is the only thing they can see. So you define that file. Here's where it gets just a little more complicated. You either configure a radio or rat flector or a TNC. Uh, as you can see in my list, all those that are prefaced with net colon, those are different rat flectors that I can connect to. And then anyone connected to those, we can chat, we can send files, etc. The com one, the ones uh, defined as COM1 are different radios that I have that I would connect to. And the bottom one would be a, a KISS TNC. It's a KPC3, a KISS TNC that I'm connected to. So I select the one I want, generally only one over on the left side. When I want to add one, you'll get this little add a port screen over on the right. You'll select the type. If you're connecting to a radio, it'll be through a serial port. Or if it's a rat flector, it'll be network over the internet or dongle or whatever device that you're using. Pretty simple to set that up. In that getting started document, since different radios, different D-Star radios use different baud rates, that document will tell you how to set it up. 
in there. It's got a table with all of the, the baud rate and all the menu settings that you need to do. In the messaging, you can send and receive messages between stations. You can also, if one of the stations is connected to the Internet, you can send regular SMTP email in and out on DRAT. So that's handy. How many of you use FL Digi or the NBeams package? Nice, nice package. You can do a lot of things with it. DRATS is similar, but one thing I like about DRATS is if I'm sending out a message on FL Digi or I'm sending out, a, say, an ICS 213 form, it gets broadcast to everybody, right? And so if I receive that, is this for me, someone in my shelter, or is this for someone else? It's kind of hard to tell on first glance. With DRATS, I address that to a specific station, either by their call or tactical call. So if I'm sending it to David in Shelter 1, I would just put that in the address. It's broadcast over the air. The other stations can hear it, but it doesn't come into their inbox. So it makes it specifically addressable. Um, station to station using call sign or tactical call. Uh, you can actually send and receive WinLink 2000 messages through DRAT. So that's, that's handy as well. Attachments, any file type. Uh, however, remember you're sending over a 1200 baud channel, so you don't want to send a 5 megabyte Excel file or a 25 meg picture. Here's the messaging screen. Looks an awful lot like an email client. You've got your inbox, outbox, all of those ones. So you compose a message, uh, you receive a message, you're sending it here. On the right side, you'll see a list of stations that you are seeing that are either connected together through a rat flector. And so it knows those stations and how long ago it last heard from them, which you'll see comes in handy. If, if they are not seen, if, they, if, if DRATS has not seen that station that you send a message to, it's going to hold it until it does see them. Then it will send the message out. Chat, just like instant messaging. However, you can set up kind of private chat rooms or chat channels to uh, take some of the conversation off the main chat. Um, we use this uh, quite a bit locally when we're doing a, a DRATS net. Um, we'll just take check-ins on the chat screen. You can just say WB4QDX um, in Duluth, checking in. File transfer, like I mentioned in showing the screen, the left side, it looks like an FTP screen. Left side is my local computer, the right side is the station I'm connecting to, and it's going to pull down a list when I connect to that station. In this case, it was 9A6AJB-5, because he was on the list over there. And when I connected to him, it brought down the file list of what he has stored in that designated folder. So I can go drag and drop to or from his folder. All right, so that's DRATS. I'd, I'd really invite you to try that. Great program for just simple communications over the data channel. A DVAP. This was my uh, first way that I used to use a DV access point. I had a little netbook. You see the DV access point. Here are the little red box with an antenna. And this is my Verizon MiFi card because it had to get to an internet connection. So this was my portable DVAP configuration. Now, that worked well for me for a while, but I kind of hated dragging around that old netbook. Remember, we used to think netbooks were so cool. So version two of that, I said, hey, this Raspberry Pi is a neat thing. It's, uh, if you haven't seen that, they're a small credit card sized Linux computer. Um, doesn't have a hard drive. You put everything on an SD card uh, that attaches to it. It has two USB slots, Ethernet, HDMI. 
and um, has a 5 volt micro USB connector to power it. Um, if you get a chance to go by the Internet Labs booth that um, developed the, the DV dongle and DV access point, uh, Robin is developing a daughter board that will plug into those pins up here and uh, add a DV dongle to it as well. Lots of good things happening with it. Okay, I can replace now my laptop or my netbook with this little Raspberry Pi. And that's it at the bottom. So my configuration has gone a little smaller. And you see my two power sources. I can plug in the cigarette lighter or AC. Let's take it one step further. I wanted to put it in a box. I went to Fry's. I found a little Pelican case. It is. It is a Pelican brand case. This is it. That's what you're looking at up there. Uh, I have in the bottom of this, which you can't see, there is one of those USB battery chargers for your phone that has a USB 5 volt output. So it's a 10,000 milliamp hour battery. I can run this standalone. I run it all day at a ham fest and didn't run the battery down because this draw doesn't draw a whole lot of current here for the Pi or the DV access point. So with my little battery operated Verizon MiFi card and this, I'm set. I throw this in the car. Uh, this is how we uh, drove up from Atlanta yesterday. Threw this in the back seat. And I had D-Star coverage all the way from Atlanta. No gaps. Um, it's actually pretty easy to do. Here are all the components. Now, the most difficult part of this is getting an image on the SD card to make the software work. Because on that SD card is the, the Linux operating system and any software that you need. To make this work, there's a couple of different varieties of software that runs the DVAP. One is by Internet Labs, and it's called um, DV, I just went blank, DV Tool. Um, DVAP Tool, I'm sorry, DVAP Tool. And there's a version that he compiled for the ARM processor of this. And there is a DVAP tool version at this link up here. And the question came up during the break. Uh, the power, these PowerPoint slides will be posted next week on dstarinfo.com. So you'll have access to these and any of these complicated links up there. If you want to run with the DVAP node software and use IRC DDB, which gives you access to additional set of reflectors as well, the XREF and DCS reflectors. Uh, there's a different version of software that runs the DVAP called DVAP Node. This is a link um, and instructions on how to load that software. Basically, with any PC, I load that image onto this little SD card. So I do that from my PC, and it's ready to go. I'm not copying the files over. I'm actually writing an image to it, just like I write, a, write to a CD and write an image to that. And then all you need to do after that, I say that like it's easy, is go in and configure what Wi-Fi sources it's going to use. And in the, uh, the version of Linux that's there right on the, the page, and I connect a, a monitor and laptop, or monitor, keyboard, and mouse to it to configure this. There is a Wi-Fi configuration tool. And I have it look for one of three Wi-Fi sources that I use 99.9% .9 of the time. First, it's going to look for my Wi-Fi in the house. It's going to look for that first. If it doesn't find that, it's going to look for my Wi-Fi card. If it doesn't find that, it's going to look for my hotspot on my phone. So it's going to look for one of those three, which will serve me. I have one of those three with me all the time I want to use it. 
So that then it will run what we call headless. You don't have to uh, put a monitor to it. It boots up, goes straight into the software. You're configured. It uh, selects the frequency for the DVAP. You're set to go. I will caution you, there was an early version of DVAP node, so use the current image, that would write new configuration parameters to the DVAP. That's been fixed, so all the versions out there should be cool with that. This is a great way to do this. I think some people are working on the BeagleBone to try to get it working with this as well. Um, wouldn't surprise me if you don't see that pretty soon. So a Raspberry Pi with a DVAP, great tool. Just for power. Wi-Fi. You can't see it here, but I have a very small USB dongle for Wi-Fi, a little Netgear. I bought this at Radio Shack. You can buy them online for 10 bucks. I think I paid 20 bucks just to get it from the Radio Shack down the street. But it's a Netgear, and it had all the drivers for Linux, and everything was very common by going with a more name brand. But this is the basic setup, and I apply whichever power I want, either cigarette lighter or AC and then I can just connect my battery which will last all day long this is one of those cell phone chargers this is made by a company Anker A-N-K-E-R bought it for 40 bucks on eBay and I just plug it in and I'm golden I've got it powered for 8 hours plus and this is a the case I chose is a Pelican 1060. Uh, there is one that is about an inch shorter than this, the 1050, that will actually, it'll all fit in there as well. I made one modification to this. Now, Pelican cases are known for being waterproof and all that good stuff. I didn't really care because I'm not going to put this out in the rain. So I wanted to drill a hole so that... When I put this in, I want the antenna to be up vertical. And so I drilled a little hole with a little stubby duck sits right through. If you can see it here, just sticking out slightly. Because I'm, I'm not interested in being waterproof. There is a little bit of heat generated in this, so I do run it at least with the, the lid up just a little bit. Under, I, I bought my, um, I'm not trying to be a, a commercial for all the sources I bought this from, but I bought this from uh, MCM Electronics, which I think is just right down the road north of Cincinnati, and someone told me they're here at Dayton as well. Uh, if they do, I'm buying another pie from them. Um, but this, uh, the little case that I chose for it is their cheapest little case for $9.00. But if you can see on the front here, it's got light pipes for the LEDs that are on the board. Uh, because I, I first one I bought was that very nice looking little put together kit that's acrylic clear. And it doesn't fit tightly together. It rattles. But this is the $9 case. And it has the light pipe so I can see the status if it's powered up, if there's Ethernet activity or whatever. So it worked very well for me. People are doing um, all kinds of different configurations of these, um, but it really adds a new dimension to D-Star that you can take it portable. Now, yes, you have to have an internet connection, but okay, if I'm in an area that doesn't have a repeater, I'm golden. I've got it. Three G is plenty fast enough. What's going over the air is about 22 kilobits. It would work with uh, the early GSM 2G as well. I have a, a, a little, I haven't done anything with it yet, but I bought a Freedom Pop dongle that comes with 500 megabytes, megabytes of 
think of it, I love it twice a day per month. And I, I just wonder if that would be enough to do it. I can't tell you. The uh, question is, really, how much data would you use, uh, cellular data? I can't really tell you for sure, but I know I use mine. I've got a six gig package on Verizon. Um, I rarely use more than two gig, and I use it for a lot of different things. So I think using this, I, I wish I could look at my, um, if I could look at my usage by day, I could look at yesterday and see what my usage was, because most of what I did was with this. I can't imagine that it would be more than 10 megabits per day or some megabytes per day or something like that. I can't say for sure if it would fit within 500 a month, but it doesn't use a whole lot of data. All right, any other questions on this? A fun project you can do for not a lot of money. There is a, a, a company, and I think they're here at Dayton also, um, that actually packaged all this in a commercial hardened package. Here's one right here. Great little unit. Um, they're proud of it, <laughs> price-wise. And you still have to add the uh, DVAP to it. But it's a nice package. It has internal batteries, brings all the connectors out, um, extremely rugged case, um, really nice packaging for it. Um, that's the company. Um, I think they're really called Hardened Power Systems out of Tennessee. Um, nice little package, but uh, if you want to go with a, a commercially built one. We touched on using D-Star on HF. The first question that usually comes about, is it legal? Well, you're using it in the voice portion of the van, which can use any mode there. Uh, it's still going to operate at about 6 kilohertz bandwidth which is about what a, a full double sideband AM signal is going to be. Um, it's available to use on the 7100, 9100 uh, radios, which are all band radios. Or you can um, put it together on one of those radios with one of the GMSK boards. I used to use it with a um, Yaesu 857. It worked well with that. This is the, uh, the 9100 on the left. Uh, and then the 7100, which can be a mobile or a base. There are, there's at least one D-Star HF net that's operating now. They're on several nights a week. Um, we've got information on the D-Star Info site. Um, we'll have some handouts also in the D-Star booth that will give you a lot more information about it. But it, it's kind of neat how this works. They start on six meters on specified frequencies. And everyone will call each other for five minutes if um, once it's and they coordinate on reflector 30C. So I say, okay, now we're going to move to 10 meters in the frequency. And people will make contacts back and forth. And they'll move to 15, 20, 40, 80. Uh, go through that over about an hour period. They are making contacts. Um, Arizona has talked to Australia regularly to the UK. Is D-Star HF going to be a mainstream mode and replace sideband? No. It does require a pretty good signal to noise and fading kind of gets in the way and HF signals fade. Uh, but it's fun to operate and to see how you can, uh, how many stations you can contact. I mean, they're making now contacts worldwide on this net. Uh, it's interesting. You forget you're on an HF radio because it sounds just like you're talking on two meters on your handheld or whatever. When it's there, it's there. It's good quality. It's fun. I'm I'm excited to get back on it. Um, I've been off of it for a while because I had my 7100 in my truck and um, didn't really get on that much. Well, now that I've got the 5100, it's in the vehicle and this has moved into the house. So I'm anxious to get back on D-Star HF. Uh, there are certain frequencies that they've designated, just this net informally. Um, normally it's just during the nets. 
but I think that'll probably expand that, you know, this is going to be kind of a standardized frequency that they'll use. Well, I, I think I showed a little bit of the configuration earlier. Uh, when you're using um, one of the GMSK modems uh, that it connects, remember you're going to want generally an all mode radio that will have 2 meter and 440 in it because it will have a 9600 baud packet port on that data connector, that six pin mini DIN that most of them have. And it, I promise you it will operate better because that 9600 port is closer to the discriminator and the modulator and gives you a good flat in and out. Uh, and that will operate better. But there's some software out there. If you'll just search Google on it, you'll find the software. Um, a guy that's going to be in the D-Star forum today, uh, Jonathan Naylor, uh, G4KLX, I think, has developed some software for that as well. So, yeah, my first experience on HF D-Star was with a 857. So it works. Mm hmm That's right. Yeah. The, uh, the, the GMSK uh, modem board or DV mode, node adapter, whichever you want to call it, offers a lot of capabilities and um, fun to play with stuff. All right, you probably want to see a little bit of the 5100 in action, don't you? How many are thinking about buying one while you're here? Oh, my goodness. Dealers are going to be smiling. Did you raise your hand, too? You're the man. Next time we do a show, you'll be part of the demo, Adrian. All right, let me see if I can pull some of this stuff together, get the camera back going here. Now, unfortunately, I'm only on a dummy load. Whoops. Uh, a dummy load, so I'm not going to be making contacts on here. But I just want you to see how relatively easy it is to use this radio. Uh, normally, I said I operate in both uh, or in dual receive mode. So if I just see, are we on here? See, go back to that. So if I just press and hold, and I'm going between either main or sub. Uh, if I just want to use my memories, I'm going to go to the different. Uh, these all change the soft memories at the bottom just by touching this. And I want to go to, well, I'm first going to take it out of DR mode, which press that button. And I'm just a, a I'm regular um, VFO mode right now, so I can tune anywhere I want to. I change the mode by just touching at the top, and I can go DV, which is D-Star Voice, FM or FM Narrow, which is going to be the 2.5 kilohertz narrow band. Uh, if I want to select one of my memories, now these are my regular memories that I talked about, not the repeater list memories. And I just put in my regular stuff that I use locally. So these are just regular memories. These right here happen to be all FM channels, so they were easy to put in. I could import them, export them from another radio and import them in here. Uh, that made it very easy to do. So here are all, you know, even simplex channels. I've even got, if I go, um, I, I keep like FRS channels and GMRS channels in here. I don't have this modified for out-of-band transmit. Gee, it would be not proper to do that on these channels, would it? Um, I have, you know, local out-of-band stuff that I might listen to, uh, and including uh, local airport. So it will copy all of those modes. Uh, these are just standard memories, and I think there are a thousand of these regular memories in the 5100. But then if I go to DR mode... Then um, I, I can use uh, the repeater list, and we went through that just a minute ago, but if I do use reflector, if I want to link to another repeater, I'd go to gateway CQ, 
And so now these are looking at all of those different repeaters that I put in. And if I just want to link to that repeater, I select the one I want. And that's going to connect to that repeater. It's going to issue a link command. And I would just, there I am to go. Local CQ. This is only for talking locally without the G and repeat to. So if the repeater is connected to a link to a reflector and I'm only using local CQ, no one outside of my local repeater is going to hear my side of the conversation. That question came up earlier that, hey, we're hearing everybody but this one guy. And he probably is in CQ, local CQ. Normally I would want to go to reflector, use reflector. My repeater list, repeater list, southeast. I can go through all of those. If I had GPS lock, I could show you nearest repeater list, which is really neat. But unfortunately, I don't have GPS lock in sight. Well, no, I thought I did for a minute. There's another little symbol right up here at the top to the right of the time. It's the SD card. It shows that I have an SD card inserted. I can, uh, using the menu, I can go to the end where it says SD card. I can either save a setting uh, off of my radio or I can load other stuff. Um, I can import and export CSV files in and so I can I can play with the SD card outside of it, put it in here, and load in memory files or whatever. Also, because you have Bluetooth, I can connect to several different devices. One of the nicest feature is some great software. See if I can show it on here. An app that is available if you have the the uh, card that, um, let's see if I can get it here. There is an app that ICOM has made available. As soon as I find it, it moves around on here. Yes, it is. Or you can go into the Google Play Store. I'm not sure whether it's going to be available on iPhone. There's something, and I'm not an iPhone expert, but the way it treats serial ports that is restricting it from doing that. Um, and why am I not finding it on here? It moves around. There it is. See if I can show this. Um, it wants to pair to my Bluetooth headset right there. So it can show what's on the radio. Let's see if there's a way I can do this that will show everything. There's a lot of different functions that can be used with this. Uh, if I want to go DR mode, it would show that screen and just display what's in the to and from. If I want to share pictures, this is a neat feature. I can take a picture on my Android phone and then I can send it to someone, Bluetooth to the radio, and then it comes out on theirs on the other end. And I can select different resolutions for the picture, different qualities. I can just text message and when I text message, it looks kind of like your text messaging app. It's using the data channel, so it's going to go back and forth through it. If I go mapping, it can show where I am using the, deep, the uh, GPS. All of the functions you see down below, all of those are available. I can uh, change the transceiver settings. Uh, I can import and export. Um, I have actually used my Plantronics Bluetooth headset, uh, paired it with this, and was able to use it to transmit and receive. I'd use the button on the side of it, press and hold, I get a beep, 
about a half second, puts the radio in transmit, and uh, I can talk. Hit it again, toggles back to receive. There is an accessory for this that you can buy a Bluetooth headset, an icon accessory, um, but a variety of things will work with this. Um, an awful lot of features on this radio. You can do crossband repeat directly from a menu. If I go into others and I go into repeater mode, it will allow me to go into crossband repeat without setting up a bunch of very special codes and gyrations like you have to do on most radios to do crossband repeat. Um, backing up, formatting the SD card. Uh, I can have it on sounds. I can have it announce call signs when it receives them. That's, that was nice for me for about two minutes. And then I got tired of hearing A, B, 4, <laughs> and on and on. So you've got all of those different functions. I can determine the loudness of it, a lot of uh, capabilities to determine what I use the speech for. Um, display, I can change a lot with that. Functions, there, the, the speech, I can determine what I want to, when it receives, do I want to announce the call sign? Uh, when I change frequencies, announce the frequencies. So there's features that can work also for uh, uh, people that may be uh, sight impaired as well. As well. Um, gosh, this radio does so much. If I just want to set up a basic duplex and tone, that's so easy to do, just like on a regular radio. Um, digital code. It's like a digital PL code. Um, if, for example, I'm on, I, the most useful thing I would think would be on Simplex. Um, I only want to talk to David. I only want my radio to open up when I hear David in there. We both do that digital code, and it's just like a, a, a PL. You could have it where the repeater may require it, um, but you really don't do that on digital repeaters now. I mean, some of the other modes, they'll put in a color code or something like that, but it's that's what it is. It's like digital PL. That may be it. Simplex and use that digital squelch code. Um, there are so many functions. This operates full 50 watts uh, or um, some lower power settings as well. Um, the DR mode in it makes it really spiffy. Uh, the head unit, if, if you didn't get a chance to see it, the actual size of it is pretty large. And I know your first complaint that you're going to have, it doesn't come with the, the bracket backplate for it. Uh, that is an accessory for it, but on the other hand, there may be a lot of ways that you want to um, configure it. Um, I got an idea coming up here of how I want to mount mine in the vehicle now, mount the head. Uh, the same bracket for just about all of the radios work for the base unit. It's not supplied with it, but that's the same one that fits it. The little backplate for the 2820 is, will also fit this one as well. Any questions about this radio and what it will do? Um, I made up my own custom one. They supply one with it, a very long cable. It's six pin modular, like an RJ14 on both ends. It's the same on both ends. So if you get a six conductor cable, and I'm using a six conductor flat phone cable, and I had make sure that your pins uh, and it have all six, not just four, like standard telephone. You can make and, and do it pin for pin. Don't flip them like a phone cable. Uh, you can make a different length that you want. The mic connector, you can use a standard Ethernet cable. It's an eight pin RJ45. Uh, I've already made a 
different connector because I've got the base unit down the floor and the mic cord is a very tight coil. Um, so I've got just a little, I used a little short Ethernet cable and an Ethernet coupler. Sure. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I made up a couple of links for different ones that I use. I got a very short one. So if I'm using uh, it right there with it, you cannot attach the head to the base unit. They're made to be separate. Because you've got the connectors on the front for the mic and then the connecting cable to the head unit. Uh, no, no. Uh, it. Um, th the question was, does it have the quarter twenty like a camera base thread on it? It's got two M two point five metric. Um, it takes those screws for the back. Again, the one that the twenty eight twenty back plate will fit that as well, or you can buy that with the magnets as an accessory for this. Yes, sir. No, no. I wish that was the case. No, but you can extend it real easy with an Ethernet cable. Any other questions? Doesn't for me. I've used it. I mean, if if you had your antenna close into the radio, yeah, you might get some RF in. But I'm just using a standard Ethernet cable that I made up. Uh, just a little uh, two foot cable to give me a little extension from down here to be able to use it. Yeah, I've seen this. But you're running more power too. Remember on that, you can run up to 100 watts on that. Okay, this discussion has just been on a thread. Um, there are two different ways to use GPS data on all of the, the radios. One mode on every radio prior to the 5100 is called GPS or GPSA. I hope I have this right because I'm falling on my sword on this on the 5100 group. GPS, well, let me, let me start with GPSA, formats it as a standard APRS formatted message. I hope I don't have this backwards. And so if you transmit in GPSA mode or on the 5100, that's called NMEA, which it, if, if I'm right on this, the manual is reversed. That just transmits a standard APS formatted message, and the repeaters have a module on there which will gate that information to the APRS network. So if you have GPS turned on and you have it where it will send your coordinates when you push to talk, every time you talk, you're sending those to the APRS network. So if you go to APRS.FI, APRS.net, any of those, it will display your position along with APRS stations. Now, there are some other functions that ICOM implemented so that you can get bearing and distance to another station. It required some different data in that message string. And so that is called GPS on every radio but the 5100. It's called DPRS on the 5100. Now, without doing anything special, you get distance and bearing from another ICOM or another D Star radio transmitting G GPS and an ICOM radio. F but it will not, in a standard format, gate to the APRS network without doing one thing. If you go to this site called DPRS Calculator, Google it, go to DPRS Calculator. Pete Lovell out of Texas wrote a little program that's on all D-Star repeaters that let you use that ICOM formatted GPS or DPRS on the 5100 and you enter a little string from that DPRS calculator based on your call sign, an SSID if you want to put it in there, and the symbol you want to use like car, truck, pedestrian, whatever, and you put that in TX message right here in GPS. 
that will then let me see under GPS set not there I'd have to find it on here but TX message here's another important thing if you put that string in there you get both the distance and bearing to another radio plus it gates to the APRS network. It's very simple to do, but go to DPRS calculator and it will give you that string. Now, here's a, an important thing right here. Here I'm selecting either DPRS or NMEA. So that's like GPS or GPSA on the, the previous radios. And then I want to do GPS Auto TX. This is real important. You do not want to beacon on a repeater. You do not want to let it send your position every so often. Because it's like somebody just periodically keying up the repeater. And you'll find that guy because about every 10 minutes his call sign will come up. So you want to set auto TX to off. And then you want to set it. where it is, let me see, where you only, I did find it on here, where you only send GPS with push to talk. Every time you push to talk, it'll send your message. That's perfectly acceptable, but don't beacon. Please don't beacon. We had a guy doing it during a net with 50 repeaters connected to it. It was obnoxious. All right. Any other questions on the 5100? There'll be, uh, I think, dealers have got them. The ICON booth will have them. We'll have them in the D-Star booth. It's on the main floor. Can't speak for everyone. I think I've seen prices anywhere from 749 There may be some better prices on that around. I would think you're probably going to get a good price from someone here at Dayton. Yeah, uh, that does not include the Bluetooth board, but it, it's a nice accessory to have in it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that they were uh, the Bluetooth boards were a little more in short supply during the first week or so, but I think they're out there now. Any other questions? All right, just to reiterate, yeah, one more question. Any any question, any D-Star question? Uh, two of my local repeaters are having difficulty coming gateway. What I wanted to ask is really if you're the best familiarity with configuring that part of the software, I'm looking for a steer on what i got to learn to fix that. I have some error messages. Come by one of two places. Come by the D-Star booth on the the Hair Arena floor, or go by the Internet Labs booth and see Robin Cutshaw, AA4RC. The guy has configured dozens of repeater gateways. He'll be your one of your best sources. There will also be some other guys in the D-Star booth, Jim McClellan, part of the Texas Interconnect team, trust servers. We'll, we can help you with those questions there. Any other questions? All right, the PowerPoint will be posted next week on www.dstarinfo.com. The video will be posted on the ICOM America site in within a couple of weeks. And we'll also have the files, links to them on dstarinfo.com. Uh, they'll probably be accessible through YouTube as well, that our thing. And we'll have links to that on the dstarinfo.com. You are welcome to use the PowerPoint slides from this, your local clubs or whatever you're doing, D-Star demos, we just like to put the information out there where people can use it uh, as much as they'd like. Uh, if you have any questions after this, uh, info at dstarinfo.com, and uh, we have a group of people that will try to answer your questions as promptly as possible. Go forth and do D-Star. Thank you so much for coming today. Yeah.